Welcome students to Unit 9, Solutions. Today we will be talking about solutions and solubility curves, Unit 9.1. So a solution is a mixture of two or more substances. For example, the air you're breathing is a solution, or the soda you're drinking is a solution. Even the stool you're sitting on is a solution because there are two or more things in it. Now solutions are homogeneous meaning there's an equal distribution of particles throughout. So for example, the air you're breathing is mostly nitrogen, but there's also some oxygen sprinkled in, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and it's equally distributed throughout that whole mixture. You don't walk through the halls of Mentrill High School, come across a pocket of carbon dioxide, and fall down dead. There's a homogeneous mixture around you, that air, equal distribution of particles. Now, a solution has two parts, a solute and a solvent. The solute is whatever you have less of. Solute is less letters than solvent. Then solvent, the solvent is whatever you have more of. The solvent dissolves the solute. You put things into your solvent. So like, for example, your air you're breathing is 80% nitrogen. 16% oxygen, which leaves 4% other garbage, we would say the air you're breathing, the solvent is the nitrogen, the solute is everything else. Generally speaking, the solvent determines the state of matter of the solution. So the air you're breathing is a solution of gas and gas, so obviously it's a uh, gas. However, if you dissolve a gas into a liquid, the liquid still exists. So you have a solution that is a liquid. Soda is an example of a gas dissolved into liquid. Or if I have two metals and I dissolve one into another, that makes an alloy. Alloys are solutions of metals. Which brings us to note quiz question one and two. Pause the video and answer unit 9.1 note quiz question one and two. Things dissolved based on their attraction. Like dissolves like. So when something has a charge, like a salt for example, then things with a charge or a partial charge can dissolve them. So for example, the reason that salt dissolves in water is because the water molecules have a positive side, the hydrogen, which surrounds the negative anions. So the chloride ions in your salt get surrounded by water, its hydrogen end. And as long as there's enough water to surround the cation, the sodium in this case, and keep them separate from one another, to keep them from attracting to one another, that's when your salt dissolves. The cation is surrounded by the negative side of water, the oxygen end. When water does this, this is an example of hydration. Or solvation is your SAT word for dissolving something in water. So when it comes to solutions, solutions again are homogeneous and they tend to not, and they can't be filtered. You can't pass them through filter paper. Most solutions are transparent. You can see through them. And they don't refract light. In order to separate the solute from the solvent, you would have to evaporate it. I'd have to allow those intermolecular forces to weaken and then it could, I could separate them. If something dissolves, we say it is soluble or miscible. If something does not dissolve, we say it's insoluble or immiscible. And how much you can dissolve is known as a solution's solubility. Like dissolves like, so polar compounds will dissolve polar compounds, including salts. Salts, remember, are when we have a cation surrounded by anion. So polar compounds will dissolve polar compounds and salts. Nonpolar compounds can only dissolve nonpolar compounds. So when something is, so when a molecule is symmetrical, like this benzene ring here, 
benzene is nonpolar, that means it will only dissolve other nonpolar things. In fact, you can use benzene or acetate in order to dissolve things like plastic bags. They still exist in solution, so please don't do that because it's not exactly environmentally friendly. Also, benzene is a carcinogen, I believe. So with that being said, here is your next few note quiz questions. Pause the video and answer note quiz questions three, four, and five. How quickly something dissolves is known as its rate of solubility. The more molecules you have, the more things can dissolve. So we can speed up how quickly molecules dissolve by stirring them. If you've ever made Kool-Aid before, you know it's way easier to make your Kool-Aid if you stir it. Or if you heat it up, hot Kool-Aid, actually you can dissolve way more Kool-Aid in there and make Kool-Aid so strong it could melt your teeth, basically you could heat up your solution because those molecules will move faster because those molecules will move faster and allow them to keep your ions separated from one another. You can also dissolve things faster by breaking them up. If I have a tablet of Alka-Seltzer, it'll take a moment or two to dissolve in water, but if I were to crush the tablet up, it will dissolve much faster because now those particles are open to water molecules striking them from all angles, whereas before molecules on the inside are insulated. Temperature and pressure will affect the solubility of uh, some things. For example, temperature will affect the solubility of solids. Pressure will not. However, pressure will affect the solubility of gases. Gases dissolve best under high pressures and low temperatures. As you cool down a gas, its intermolecular forces start building up and solutions can take advantage of that. So this is why soda is bottled at a high pressure and a low temperature because it forces those molecules into solution. We actually can graph how much of a particular solvent you can place into solution on what's known as a solubility curve. Solubility curves show how many grams of a solute you can put at a given temperature in 100 grams of water. Remember that the density of water is one gram for every milliliter, so this also could be read as how many grams you could fit in 100 milliliters of water. So if I were looking at, say, sodium nitrate, anywhere along this line I have a saturated solution, which simply means I have the most amount of solute, the most amount of solute where every single water molecule is holding those ions separated from one another. So the line represents a saturated solution at a given temperature for some amount of water, for 100 grams of water. So at 10 degrees, I can fit 80 grams of sodium nitrate in 100 milliliters of water. Any substance with a positive slope is a solid at room temperature, while things with a negative slope tend to be gases at room temperature. This is because as temperature increases, gases become less soluble, they expand. As temperature increases, solids become more soluble because the water is able to hold more of them. So on a line is known as a saturated solution. Above a line is known as super saturated. In a supersaturated solution, you would have a precipitate. So if I've got a supersaturated solution, I would have some stuff on the bottom. The water molecules are pulling them apart at the same rate at which they are forming back into a solid. So for example, as I put salt into solution, the water molecules are able to separate those salt atoms those salt ions from one another up to a certain point. At some point, there's not going to be enough water to separate, keep those ions separated from one another. So as I keep adding salt, I'll eventually reach the saturation. The solution will become saturated and the salt will begin building up on the bottom, forming a precipitate right there. Notice that the molecules are still moving. Those ions are coming back together as water molecules drop them. It's kind of like a juggling act. My water molecules are juggling those ions, but they can't keep all those balls in the air. I could add more water and make an unsaturated solution. 
and now there's enough water molecules to keep them separated from one another. So supersaturated is anywhere above the line, unsaturated is anywhere below the line, where I've got more than enough water molecules to keep them separated from one another. So reading a solubility curve is simply a matter of reading the graph and knowing what you're talking about. So on page 13 they say how many, what is the solubility of potassium nitrate at 70 degrees Celsius. So on the graph you find potassium nitrate, that's this line right here, at 70 degrees Celsius. You find 70 degrees, you follow it up, you could fit 130 grams in 100 milliliters of water. If we were to double the amount of water, like hypothetically, in 200 milliliters of water, how much could you fit? You could fit twice as much. You have twice as many atoms of water to hold them separate from one another. So 260 grams could fit in 200 milliliters of water. If we reduced it in 50 milliliters of water, you could fit half as much. So 65 grams of potassium nitrate could fit in water. With that, you can finish page 13. You can also do note quiz questions six, seven, eight, nine. For number 10, a salt is insoluble when the cation's attraction for the anion is way stronger than its attraction for water. So if water were to come by, this attraction is too strong, the water can't separate them. We call these insoluble salts. So for example, iron hydroxide is insoluble. Less than 1% of it actually dissociates. That should be enough for you to finish your note quiz questions. You'll also be able to do page 12 through 14 looking at solubility curves. Use the solubility curve on page 13. I will see you next time when we talk about the different units of concentration.